Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Perrin's Patriots Talk podcast. We have a blast today with, of course, Phil Perry, the senator, joining us as always. And Matt Castle is with us. And we're going to get real in-depth on what would be your preferred destination as a quarterback? Would you rather be Zach Wilson in New England or Mac Jones in New York? Playing for Gotham, having your skill set. Which guy would find the most success? Which AFC East quarterback will have the best career? We're going to project. We're going to get into the X's and O's. We're going to have a blast. Stay tuned. Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast starts now. As advertised, it's the handsomest former quarterback in the business. It's Matt Castle. How you doing, fella? I'm doing great, partner. How are you? Great. There's Phil. He's got sketchy internet, so he might freeze up and make just a face like this at some point. Gosh, he looks great, though, doesn't he? I thought you were going to say most handsome former Patriots quarterback and bring Brady into the discussion. That would have had the people buzzing if you would put Castle Ooh. number one over Brady. Oh, geez. I guess I know what side you're on, Phil. I guess I know what side you're on. I'm just saying the people have opinions. Jimmy's also a handsome fella. Yeah, it's okay. Be that as it may, we're short on time. So let's get right to this video with Mac Jones giving a little inside football winkaroo to Landon Roberts. The cameraman happened to catch a shot of you winking (laughs) Landon Roberts. No, that's just something in your eye. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just, I mean, yeah, it was just kind of fun in games. But, um, yeah, it was just in the middle of the play. They actually, like, called out our play. So I was like, ah, oh, nice catch, you know. But, anyways, it was just fun in games. <laughs> what did you say? No, I just, I mean, I just stuck to what I was supposed to do. You know, sometimes they don't know the answers either. <laughs> All right, Matthias. You ever get to the line of scrimmage and get sniffed out and just give the old winkaroo? Uh, you know, there, there's been plenty of times where you come to the line of scrimmage and somehow the linebacker or safety will call something out and you're going, oh my gosh, they know the play. <laughs> but I love the fact that Mac Jones just was like, you know what? I'm going to wink at this guy and just let him know, you know what? You're on to something and still run the play. I mean, I remember one time, though, as much as they are, occasionally get it right. A lot of times they're wrong. They're yelling out stuff. I vividly remember I was in Kansas city and we're playing San Francisco and Justin, gosh, what's Justin big defensive lineman was sitting there. He's going, the run's coming this way. The run's coming this way. And I just, I stopped my cadence and I go, no, it's not Justin. And then we <laughs> ran the other way. <laughs> and, but you could you could have fun with guys out there. I mean, that's part of playing ball too, is that interaction. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong, but they're more often than not, they're wrong. But I do love the fact that Mac Jones is just like, hey, yeah, you got it right. Justin it, Smith still having nightmares about that. Justin moment, Smith. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Bengals exactly and the Niners. Good job, Phil. I was trying to figure it out. He was good. Yes, yeah. he was good. Let's move on from Mac Jones, which I think we've, hammered enough and get into the Mac Jones, Zach Wilson Mm. conversation. Would you, Matt, as a quarterback, rather be Mac Jones with the New York Jets for the rest of your career or however long you're with the Jets or Zach Wilson with the Patriots? All the skills travel with you. Oh, a hundred percent. Zach Wilson with the New England Patriots. Are you kidding me? No. Yes. Making more money in New York. You're in Gotham center of the universe you're still with the jets and a a team that yes they've got some firepower on the outside they've got a terrible offensive line zach wilson got sacked six times last week was hit more than anybody probably and a young defense with and a new new head coach are you kidding me i absolutely would be zach wilson with the patriots i love mac jones i love what he brings to the table but the patriots organization the way it's set up for success i would much rather be with the Patriots organization, whether it's Zach Wilson or Mac Jones, if that's what you're asking me, but Zach Wilson. Yeah, so I think, Phil, we're almost at a point where no matter who the Patriots took, it was going to be the best situation for them. Could have been Justin Fields, could have been Trey Lance. And we would honestly, when you get down to it. You have to, though, understand the good thing about this situation here in New England, the fact that they give you the answers, right, that Josh McDaniels was talking about at the line of scrimmage the other day. 
that can also make it a, I mean, Matt knows this better than anybody, a really difficult offense to grasp. And I'm not sure we know yet if Zach Wilson is the same kind of quote unquote, supercomputer that, that Mac Jones might be at least. And so can you insert a guy like that, Matt, if he's not at the same level that Mac Jones is at this stage of his career, could you insert him even given all the good physical skills that he has and still expect him to have some success being that kind of quarterback. Right. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. You have to have high football IQ to play in this offense because they put so much on your plate and there's so much responsibility on you pre-snap really getting guys in the right formation, the motioning that takes place, understanding why you're setting up this formation and pre-snap formation. When I say that, I mean, who's covering who, you know, when we put the tight end outside, who is it their safety out there and understanding that's man to man. If a safety's out there, if a corner's out there, it's zone, but then you base your check off of that. And then it's all the things that go along with running the play successfully. So you have to be a high level thinker in this offense. We don't know. I don't know everything there is to know about Zach Wilson, if he can manage that, you know, but at the same time, Mac Jones can, and that's what is going to make him very successful in this offense. But if you do have a skill set the way that Zach Wilson does, I mean, you can do a lot of things and kind of hide those inconsistencies maybe in the mental part of the game and let him grow into that as he goes. And again, you see it across the league with a lot of young quarterbacks where look, they, they come to line of scrimmage, the center's calling out the mic that takes something off their plate. They, they simplify the check with me game. They make it very simple rather than very complex. And maybe they just go out there and run their plays and let their athleticism take over. And we saw some of that too last year with cam right early on, particularly with a short and off season coming in, he didn't have all the toolbox that probably Mac Jones does at this point, just because of, the off season that he got to go through the steep learning curve that he had and all, also the success that he had in preseason. So um, it, it would be interesting, but you wouldn't open up that entirety of the playbook until they got comfortable with him being able to do it. I wonder if Mac Jones and his presumed success in 2021, no, we're putting the card ahead of the horse is going to make GMs and coaches reevaluate how much they value the toolsy quarterback relative to the talented quarterback because the toolsy quarterback as we've said phil a couple times this week the scrap heap's pretty high with them whether it's a mitch trubisky or soon to be a daniel jones or a sam darnold their strength was not their aptitude their strength was their size their arm strength their production in college and i wonder if it could flip phil I think what Mac Jones has going for him is the ability to process just raises his floor. But right, will it have, do that? Will other teams say, well, shit, we're up here drafted eight and we're going to take this, you know, use Justin Fields or Trey Lance as an example. I mean, we heard the conversation around Justin Fields, unbelievable player. I thought he would have been the best player the Patriots could have taken in April. And now I'm looking like, my God, why would I, why would you want to take a guy who still probably wouldn't be on the field? Well, you just have to strike that balance, right, Matt? I think there are teams that are so enticed by the physical skills that are being brought to the position in 2021. And as long as they have somebody who can process enough, they feel like they have a potential superstar on their hands. And I think some of that might come back to coaching hubris, right? Well, right. let's just bring this guy in. We'll coach him up. We're really good at our jobs. We'll make him better at his. And maybe there's a little bit of an overestimation that happens on that side of the equation at times. Right. And, and you also look at a guy like Patrick Mahomes, for instance, when he's coming out of college, do you know if he could handle that offense and make all those checks, but you saw the physical ability and really until they get into that offense, until they get comfortable in that offense, you don't know what you have, you know? And so yes, processing is a key component to successful quarterbacking. There's no doubt about that. You've got to be able to go up there and operate at the line of scrimmage and all the successful quarterbacks I've ever been around or played with, they can do that at a high level, but everybody has a different learning curve. Everybody has a different ability to actually process things quickly. And so sometimes it takes a little bit longer for other guys, but you, at the same time, when you look at a skill set and the ability to throw the ball or a guy like Lamar Jackson, the, the stuff that he can do with his legs and the ability to set him up for success. I mean, those are unique mm. skill sets that not everybody has. So he might, you might be the best processor, but also if you go into the wrong offensive offensive unit or structure or scheme, 
none of that stuff's going to make any difference for you because you're not going to be able to use your brain the way you want it to anyway. But the skill set will be able to help you succeed because you can make plays. Jackson's going to be a great case study almost in some ways. He's already been a league MVP. He's already got so many absolutely electric plays in his career. Yet when a team can say, okay, it's the Ravens, it's this week, we're preparing for this one playoff game, everything goes into this, how are we going to deal with Lamar Jackson, we're taking him away, the Ravens haven't had success. And there's the, the toolbox, the toolbox that he starts with is a different one than Mac Jones's toolbox, which is more transitional like he can do more like mac jones can do more things even though he's limited in that one thing i don't want to spend too long on that we'll watch it all develop but um did mac jones take too much punishment matt in the first game of the year and were you concerned by that he did take a lot of punishment i mean he he, he was getting hit a lot I, I love the fact that he just kept coming back for more and kept making throws under duress, under pressure. And that's a great sign for this team that he can take a hit and he's not rattled by it. His composure was incredible. Um, but yes, you don't want Mac Jones taking hits like that consistently throughout the year. And I think that a lot of teams are going to challenge him continuously um, to, to pressure him, to see if he'll continue to make those plays under duress. But if the, the thing that they can, the best thing that they can do and Mac Jones himself is go out and continue to make plays when they do pressure him. Cause it'll stop it because big plays usually happen when they do pressure. And if he can recognize it, protect himself with protection or give him the toolbox to just get the ball out quick. And they, they hurt somebody when they do pressure that'll help him. But I, I don't want to see him get hit a lot. Nobody wants to see their quarterbacks get hit a lot. Cause it's a long season and that starts to wear on you. And sooner or later that bump, becomes a bruise, becomes something that's lingering. And it's just, it's tough to continue to compete week in and week out when you're hurting. Yeah. I think Matt really hit on it there where the Patriots have to punish opposing defenses that send pressure with big plays, because as well as he did the other day, and he did phenomenally in my opinion, he was 19 for 23 when blitzed. It was for about 150 ish yards so it wasn't like the yards per attempt were through the roof he really wasn't killing them over the top it was with short stuff because he felt like the ball had to come out quickly I think he hit a couple he hit Nelson Aguilar down the sideline took a huge shot on that play from a Dolphins blitz there was the Jacoby Myers throw that was almost completed that Jason McCourty broke up versus cover zero like he almost hit them for for several big ones but he really only hit him for one and so I think that's going to be key Tom moving forward is that they're able to dial up a couple more deep shots that they can hit to kind of force those defenses to soften up. I, I wonder, Tom, if he took so many hits that he actually left some meat on the bone at times. There was one play down the field where it looked like he maybe left Jonu Smith kind of open for what would have been a big gain, but he had probably already been hit eight or nine times mm -hmm. at that point in the day. Mm -hmm. And so I understand him wanting to get rid of the football quickly in that one. Then, Matt, do you think with that in mind, the Jets might look at it and say, look, he's tough, but as the game wore along – he was leaving some plays on the field. And do you think the Jets will continue to try to do the pressure that the Miami Dolphins did? Well, if it's within their scheme, which Robert saw is really more of a guy that's they'll line up and they just kind of play their scheme because they want guys to know what to do. So this is a perfect team to go out and game plan against. They'll probably have their dialed up third down blitz, maybe some red zone stuff. They are a do what they do defense in terms of the Jets and Robert Saul and the way that they kind of schematically approach it. They want their defenders to get lined up, know what to do, play fast, rally to the ball. So it's not going to be very complex like the Miami Dolphins were last week with a multitude of different DBs in there, different packages with nickel and dime and blitzing and different disguises. They'll try to do a little bit of it, but they'll, they'll test him. The thing, like I always say, anytime you can go out and hurt the blitz, they won't continue to repeat that blitz because they're like, gosh, they've got an answer. If you have an answer, then they really won't come after you, but they, they've got to continue to hurt people when they do. And, and again, when you go up also against a team like this, you have a good understanding for what they do fundamentally. So then it's not as complex as when you go up against other teams that might be more dynamic in their scheme. How do you define a blitz? We've talked about this, Phil and I, because Mayo said, look, a blitz is six guys, a pressure is five. Do you subscribe to that? inside football definition or more of the layman's definition of, whoa, that guy's coming from someplace we didn't expect. That's a blitz. 
Yeah, I mean, again, a blitz is what? What do you say? A blitz is. Five he minutes? says a blitz has to be six. Right, a blitz is like and an pressure over, is overload pressure, uh, and then a pressure is five. So really, you're talking about a single backer. Some people refer to it as a as a dog, a single dog, right? And then they've got all different terms for when you bring a Sam Mike pressure. You might bring a Will. But Wilson do you call it a blitz, a blitz just for simplistic purposes? You know what? As as we defined it when we were in New England, and I always kind of carried this over. It'd be like blitz one nickel blitz one right and th and that's just saying sam blitz one meaning the sam came it's a blitz you know or it's sam mike blitz zone three you know, so we never described it as a pressure or a blitz we just defined it as a hey, sam mike blitz zone three that means the sam and the mike came when you say blitz zone three that means it's a single high defense you know that and usually when you say blitz zone that means that the defensive end on the opposite side is dropping out into coverage. And so there's just ways to define how you would describe pressure versus blitz, but you just kind of, it all ran into the blitz category. And the Sam is a strong, Sam is a strong, Mike is the middle. Right. And blitz zone and, and single and, high means it was one safety back. Right. Right. When you say blitz zone, that just means they're taking one defender and dropping another defender out into coverage. So usually it's it's substituting a linebacker for pressure with a defensive end. So it's Mac, a blitz zone scheme. Is that what the Patriots might see on Sunday, knowing that Sala has this Seattle style cover three defense that he likes when they do blitz? Would that be the type of blitz that they would see, you think? Absolutely. It'll be more more of the blitz zone category in which they usually like to substitute. They they overload pressure you one side, but then they drop a defensive end out into a zone to cover their zones and to be sound in that formation and, and like just how, how they're approaching, approaching it. And then usually what you get is more pressure in terms of the blitz one category. When I say blitz one, it's usually one extra defender coming, but they're manning up the scheme because they don't want to give you any easy throws when it comes to third down, particularly third and short. And that's where you usually get a lot more of your – just tight man coverage because they don't want to give up any easy, easy completions for a third down conversion. Easy to go against difficult to go against because we've seen the Patriots and Tom Brady shred the cover three. I love going against cover three defenses. I love going against cover three defense. The old school two Tampa was always great because again, for a quarterback, you have to be disciplined with your eye control, right? You, you usually have to work defenders one way or another to manipulate that underneath the co underneath coverage. But you also create a ton of highs and lows. You also have easy outlets. Define that, will you? Yes, a high low is when you're putting a you're you're running a, like a receiver out in front of a defender, an underneath defender, okay, and then behind them you've got say an in cut. <laughs> Say is all right. So you're running up to 14 yards, you're running in. So what you're trying to do is stare that underneath defender down to the guy that's underneath to throw it over his head. Now, if that guy gets a tremendous amount of depth, I'm saying the defender and gets into the hole of where you're going to throw that in cut, then you just work your high low, right? You're seeing that defender. It's off of what he does. You're either going to throw it high, you're going to throw it low, or you're going to work right to your back. So when I say high low, it's a lot of those type of plays and a lot of a lot, lot of plays that you should know where to go with the ball, and it shouldn't be a lot of disguise to where you're confused at all before the, the snap takes place. It looked like the touchdown throw that Mac Jones threw was was sort of a little bit of a high-low situation where they ran a corner route, right, and they ran a little sort of whip or return route underneath uh, the same corner. Route. They call this, a little invert route. That's exactly invert. right. So, yeah. so it was a little, little bit of a high-low on that corner near That's the exactly sideline. Right. And he dropped to Jacoby Myers, who was deep in the, running the corner route, and he ended up throwing to Aguilar short. Matt, are, could the tight ends be good against this scheme? Because the tight ends weren't like amazingly productive in the passing game week one, but against cover three, I don't know. Is there something about that position and, and where the openings are in that defense that would make that work? Well, it should be a great matchup opportunity for those guys because a lot of times in this cover three defense, you're matched up usually – against either a linebacker or if the rotation comes down to a particular tight end it might be a safety and so with that being said they should have favorable matchups all all day against some of these linebackers and safeties as well as you know robert saw also likes to major in cover four which is a two deep look right and so even more so versus cover four when you're playing cover four, you're talking about a ton of opportunities for those tight ends uh, to get go in and work on linebackers. Cause a lot of times it's them versus the same linebacker or the will linebacker and in the 12 personnel 
it should be a really, really favorable matchup for them. Is cover four the same as quarters? Meaning quarter, that- quarter, quarter, quarter. You so got the it. Back brother. four lines. So you can't explain that to me. And I know we're going far afield. We got a TV show that we're also turning this into. We can't get this deep into it for the television show, but you folks are are on the pod are getting an extra little encyclopedic. Um, just you're getting more info. Um, so if you go quarters, you're not going to put four safeties or four defensive backs in a line across 15 yards down the field. How does quarters work? It's so a zone at the back end. So it's a zone underneath, right? And okay. the corner, the corners on the outside are re- responsible for number one on the outside. When I say that, I mean the outside, for, like the outermost wide receiver, the corners are responsible for anything going vertical outside, right? And so that's Richard collapse. Sherman. That's Richard Sherman. And they play differently. Like right? they're not going to just play off and give you all those easy throws. You'll see like almost like a press bail technique. A lot of times with eyes on the quarterback, it's still a zone. But then what happens with the safeties is if number two goes vertical, that safety is responsible for that other quarter, right? So number two get, is the second guy in from number the boundary. two, second guy. So say you're in a two by two formation, you've got a wide receiver outside two backs, corner, two tight ends, two backs, two, two, two Yes, no, two, two by two. Two, two, two by two, two means two receivers on either two receivers side. Of the on either my, side. my bad. I'm thinking 12s and 20s. So you, you've got a wide receiver on the outside. The corner would have him. But as soon as that tight end in a two by two formation goes vertical, that safety is responsible for him on the ver- on the him going vertical. Okay, it could be a sail route. It could be a seam route on the inside that he's trying to take, or even collapsing on an in cut at 14 yards. That safety is responsible because that's part of his quarter. But as soon as that number two guy he stays short, that safety immediately looks to give help to like the post route over top or something like that to number one. So he's kind of responsible for number two vertical, but as soon as he doesn't have a threat to number two vertical, he'll immediately work outside to look to give help on the number one receiver. And therefore it kind of creates a double situation there at times, right? And then the other- I'm sorry, just to to illustrate it. So if it's Aguilar on the boundary, right? And then Hunter Henry is the two inside here. If Henry doesn't take it down the seam and just kind of sits and Aguilar is going deep, then this safety is going to peel. He's freed up to go and give help. Yes. All right. Who's Which got, mean, who's though, got that, Henry? Who's well, got that's, Henry? Then? That's what Matt is saying. I think yeah. is against quarters, the tight ends or whoever's playing that slot that's what I'm could saying. have some opportunities that's to work some one on Free throw and tackle him at eight yards. It's, it's the same, it's on the same linebacker. The same linebacker has inside responsibility. Won't let him try to get inside of him, but if he does, he can pass him to the mic, but then anything going outside, he, the, that same linebacker is responsible for that tight end. So anything in that short five to 10 yard range, that Sam linebackers collapsing on that tight end has to take him in coverage. So that's so what I'm saying. One he last thing of opportunity. So that has happened. You ran mm-hmm. short Aguilar's here. You ran short. So then you're leaking James White into this area because the Sam moved over. And that's how James White or Shane Vereen or Danny Woodhead or whoever ends up with 14 catches. Right. Because now he's one-on-one with Mike linebacker. Because the Sam moved. The Sam moves, right? And now he's just got to go out and win against the Mike linebacker. So I wonder if anyone's enjoying this. I'm enjoying it. but It's very favorable, favorable matchup. I wish I could show you guys to give you a better illustration on like a whiteboard or something like that, because it would make a lot more sense in terms of defenders responsibilities, what they're looking at. And also, you know, they're just their, their jobs and what they're supposed to do on a particular play versus different route patterns. We're going to peel that painting down at some point and we are going to put a whiteboard behind you and you're Mm. just going to wheel your chair back. And we're going to do that in the next few weeks. Philly, go ahead. Or no, or just flip that very nice, very expensive painting around and just start drawing on the back of that thing. <laughs> so, here's Aguilar. <laughs> here's the corner. Uh, that would be awesome. In the AFC East, you have four young quarterbacks. I'm going to come with prediction time, forecasting time, projection time. If you had to predict which quarterback, Josh Allen, Mac Jones, Tua Tunga Vailoa, or Zach Wilson will last the longest in the league. Each of you can answer with a brief reason as to why. I'll go first. I'm going to say what I think is the obvious answer, which is Josh Allen. And the reason why I think he will last the longest is I think, number one, he is in a good situation right now, a good coach, good program, good offensive coordinator, Brian Dayball. He is massive and he can sustain any kind of punishment that's going to come his way. And he showed last year that he's more than just an athlete. He can play the position. And so you add all those things up. I think he lasts the longest. 
Maddie. Gosh, this is a tough question. I can't say the same one that Phil did. He used a lot of great reasoning. You if know? you think um, it's, it's a good, no, I mean, it's a good point. But I also think a guy like Mac Jones has the ability to last a long period of time because one, as long as they protect him, he, he won't take the same punishment that some of these other guys do like Josh Allen for as much punishment as he can take eventually that wears on you and can catch up to you. And that's the only issue that I would have with Josh Allen, but Mac Jones is in a situation where he's going to continue to get better at his processing. I know that we saw him already operate at a high level, but the, what he's able to do now and just imagine in a few years within this offense with say in with Josh McDaniel still there, but the toolbox that he'll have the, the ability to check the screens like that was the most amazing part about being part of this offense when Brady was there and I got to watch that firsthand and also even get an ability to do it later on when I got to play a little bit was just look over and say, man, they're, they're bringing pressure. I'm going to check to a seven man protection. I know exactly what I want to do on the outside. I'm going to, you know, signal Gotti, which is a go and an out route here. I know I've got one-on-one -on -one, boom. And they give you the ability to do that. Or you see cover two. I know this isn't a cover two beater. Hey, guess what guys, we're going to check this check to this. And we're going to run a read route, which is a high, low out route with an in cut in behind it. And it's a great play for cover two. So that's the fun part. And if he can continue to, to grow and develop from that side, he'll be able to really take care of himself and not put himself in harm's way. And whether That's it's, fun. whether it's Matt or Brian Hoyer, we got a couple of pretty good case studies of people who were not highly regarded coming out of college who had successful longstanding NFL careers who were starters and stayed in the league because this guy's, <laughs> why wouldn't we want to have that guy on our sideline with us? So I think that's going to be interesting to say, see too, is will Josh Allen be sought in year nine or 10, if he gets flushed out of the bill system. Next one, which one will go to the most conference championships or Super Bowls? You go first here, Maddie. Yeah, I'm going to go with Josh Allen on this one right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking at from a projection standpoint, the way this team's set up, I love Sean McDermott. I love what they've done with the organization. And uh, I just think that they're set up to win now and they've got the, uh, the ability to go out and potentially go deep in the playoffs, potentially go to the Super Bowl and start winning some Super Bowls. So right now, Josh Allen's my favorite to go out and really wreak havoc. Phil. Boy, I know this is hard. He's this got is that running start. A, this is such a, a program based goal, right? Getting to that last game, you have to have the whole program. And to me, even though Tom Brady's gone and we saw what it looked like last year, it's hard for me to, to take away from the program that's been established here over 20 years. And so if Bill Belichick is here for a long period of time, maybe if Josh McDaniels takes over for Bill Belichick at some point in time, I still have faith in the program. And so I'm going to go with Mac Jones on this one. It won't be this year. It probably won't be next year. But by the end of it, I'm going to say Mac Jones. Who's going to throw the most picks, boys? Over the course of a career. To me, that's Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson is, he's got this, this great athleticism, this really twitchy arm and great release. He is, I think, at least from what we've seen thus far, Matt, and it hasn't been much, but going back to his college days too, he's a gunslinger, man. He just, he wants to have fun out there. He wants to make some throws <laughs> that nobody else can make. He wants to roll out of the pocket, throw back across his body, and he'll make a lot of those. And he'll have some success doing that, but he's also going to throw a lot of picks. That's my answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that. I also think Josh Allen's another guy that is a gunslinger as well. And you saw it early on in his career, and he's done a much better job. But he will constantly still take some risks. Like, he, he runs around, and that's part of his big play potential, right? He makes a lot of big plays off those. But at the same time, he likes kind of that high-risk, high high-reward type situation. And you see it. You even saw it last year. Now, it worked in his favor mu much more than it had early on in his career. But at the same time, through over the longevity of his career, I can see Josh Allen being a guy that is very similar to Zach Wilson in terms of just gunslinging and, you know, o over time starts to, to th those picks start to go up and up and up. All right. Last one. All four are first round picks. That means the level of expectation is high. Which one will end up being the biggest disappointment? I want you to rank them. I'll go. I know my number one answer, and then I'll work from there. It's going to be Tua Tungavailoa is going to be most disappointing. 
Check. Then you're going to go to Zach Wilson after that as sort of a close second because he's a number two overall pick. And so, so his expectations will be ratcheted up, ratcheted up a little bit higher than everybody else's in this division. Then I'll go Mac Jones, then Josh Allen. I, unless Josh Allen falls off a cliff here, mm -hmm. it looks like they hit a home run in the top 10 with that guy. Any debate there, Matt? I mean, I don't have – I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, Tua – the, the thing about Tua is he hasn't been healthy, he came into a difficult situation. The organization's not completely sold on him right now, as you can always tell with the rumors of Deshaun Watson. Even last year, how Brian Flores handled the situation when he actually got the job and continued to go back to Ryan Fitzpatrick. I just feel like, I feel like that organization's not fully sold on him, which is going to be a disappointment. Zach Wilson... Look, let's be honest, he's with the Jets and hopefully they can turn that organization around, but it's been a tough place to play for young quarterbacks. And at the same time, been t a tough place to have continued success at. So th that's another difficult situation. Mac Jones is in a great, great, si great city, great organization, great place for him to develop his skill set, And he fits the mold of the quarterback that they needed here. So I can see him having success for a long period of time. And then Josh Allen's he's already arrived, right? He, what, the year that he put together last year, he's continued to get better throughout his career. And so barring injury or anything like that, that guy will continue to rise and be a superstar in this league. Tom, so I, I want to, I want your answer to that question. Cause I do <clears> think Max Jones where, where he was picked at 15. I think the expectations have to be lower, right? Those other guys are top 10 guys. I think once yeah. you get to the middle of the first round, it's like, Boy, at that position especially, it, it really feels like more of a crapshoot, doesn't it? I mean, but you're exactly right. There's such a running start that Josh Allen has. He would have to miss the playoffs, miss the playoffs, get eliminated in the wild card round. That team turns into a 10-7 and 7 team for it to be a disappointment. He has already surpassed expectations and been in the conversation as an MVP candidate. So it's going to be hard for him to ever be construed as that. Um but to me, it's really interesting because it comes full circle to the conversation we had at the beginning. Would you rather be Mac Jones in New York or J Zach Wilson in New England? It's all about the nest. Which nest did you fall into in the draft? Mm -hmm. And when we say Tua or Zach Wilson, those are both players we say, well, they're probably going to fail because they're in a bad spot. And I wonder if those guys were on the board at 15. Take all the shit away about the uh, explosive arm. If those guys were on the board at 15 this year, would the Patriots have taken either one? I'll leave you with that to chew on. I want a quick yes or no answer. And then we got to get the hell out of here because you people have been so patient listening to us. Babble football. We hope you've enjoyed it. What do you guys think? Or would they just say run the other way? Let's take the linebacker. Uh, that would. I really <laughs> think they might. I really think they might have done that. I, I think they would have. I think they would have taken, I don't know this for a fact, um, but knowing what they like as an offense, I think they would have gone with Trevor Lawrence, who everybody has been in love with for a decade, it feels like, or Mac Jones. And if it was anybody else, they might have gone with somebody like Zabin Collins or some defensive end that is, you know, elsewhere at this point in time. What do you think, Matt? You know, it's, that's a tough question, but I mean, if just considering where they're at at 15, the need that they had at the quarterback position. I mean, if Zach Wilson's on the board, you're absolutely going to take Zach Wilson, right? No, like, I know. I mean, <laughs> and I mean, I mean that, that, that's the second the thing guy is, on the board. Like, like, like uh, yeah, where, where are these guys? I, I think that New England was in desperate need of a quarterback, and all these guys have a tremendous skill set, and they, they think that they could probably fit the mold of playing quarterback for the New England Patriots because the pieces are in place to be successful. However, the X factor for Mac Jones was that he was here, and the fact that from a mental standpoint, from his pedigree, where he came from in Alabama, it just was the perfect fit. I guess the better way to put it is if you put a bucket in front of the Patriots and took Trevor Lawrence out of it mm. and said, here, here's Daniel Jones and Tua and Vailoa and, and stack these guys from the last three drafts, Bill, Nick, Matt, Patricia, whoever else, Josh, you guys sit there and take this bucket, empty it out and stack them the way you want to. Would Mac Jones have been, not knowing what we know now, the guy they put at the top, and where would Tua be on that list of like 10 or 12 guys? Phil, how many guys would be on that list? Boy, I don't know. I, I would just love to get – How many guys would be on – so you'd process. have Fields, you'd have the five guys from this year, take Lawrence out, so you'd have the four guys from this year. Yep. How many guys in the first 20, round last year? Uh, 2020 was Justin Herbert, Tua Tungavailoa, mm, and Joe Burrow. 
Joe Burrow would be, I think, Jeez, near the top Joe of their Burrow. list based on what we've seen from him. <clears throat> then the Justin year before Herbert, that, it was too. Justin Herbert, way up there, really smart guy. Um, the year before that was Kyler Murray's draft. It was Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, and Dwayne Haskins, I believe, were the three first round. What a fascinating mm. stack. If you're the Patriots, where would you have taken? Oh, Jordan Love was somewhere in there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Fun stuff. I Boy, think Burrow, we have... right? Burrow, Mac Jones, uh, Justin Herbert. Herbert. Justin Herbert. Did they really like Justin Herbert, too? Like Josh McDaniels went out and met with him and all that stuff as well? I'd probably rather they, have Justin think... Herbert than Mac Jones. I think they thought pretty Justin highly. Justin Herbert's of really good. <laughs> Bigger, stronger, faster, and really maybe smart. not as shrewd. We'll see. But he's a smart guy. He and I think Barrow would be up there too. So I don't know. I just would love to know if they would ever go with somebody like Kyler Murray. Just knowing what they know about like Lamar Jackson and just how dangerous and unbelievably hard to stop that that running quarterback can be. I just I would love to know if they would they would totally do a one eighty and go with something else at the position just because it's it's hard to stop. This seems like the kind of thing I could probably ask Bill in a conference call tomorrow. So, Bill, play with me here. If you take all the quarterbacks from 19, 20, and 21, take Trevor Lawrence out, but throw all the other guys in a bucket, how would you stack them? Would Max still be up there at one? Or what, what would you do with Tua? I mean, tell me. Let me know. Yeah. yeah. Just, gonna... Justin Herbert, maybe? I mean, just give, give us, your, like, your top five. Did you, like, say, did you say 19, 20? He would, he would have a fit. He'd have a field day with that. Oh, yeah. Since 1920. Anything from oh, I mean, history, got, he would love got, that. You've got, I mean, you got to go with Grange. You got to go with Grange <laughs> there. I mean, and Nagurski. I mean, what, what are you talking about? All right. Phenomenal stuff, guys. We will see you Sunday, pregame live, and of course, postgame live. Mm-hmm.